In the case of the Vietnam War, the Marines, who are another one of these groups, which are part of this and part of that, because the Marines are actually Navy, <laughs> because they're supposed to come from ships onto the shore. And the, there are these sort of vague rules about, you know, if combat is further than 50 miles inland, it's not supposed to, it's supposed to be army and whatever. Um, the Marines came to be recognized as, uh, partly because of their role in the Pacific War, as the force that was fighting in Vietnam. So the Marines were fighting in Vietnam, but also army was fighting in Vietnam. Millions of army guys fought in Vietnam. They just didn't have the training the Marines had. Um, and you didn't get drafted into the Marines, you got drafted into the army. You had to join the Marines. So it's a different whole, that's a different whole thing as well. You don't have to, I, this, is, this is just, basically you just need to hear me say this stuff. And if you're like, oh, well, okay, whatever. But there'll be times in Harris book where he talks about Marines and other times when he talks about regular army. And there's a huge distinction between these two things. It's kind of like talking about, you know, the regular army, the people who, and this is quite accurate, I suppose, in many, in many cases, if you were in the regular army, you probably had at best a high school education, if that, I mean, a lot of people have left high school. In the Marines, the idea is that you are getting the better, more educated uh, fighters who are more experienced and uh, are not 17 year old kids who have been, have lived in a ghetto all their lives and have just been vacuumed up off the streets. Uh, because you need cannon fodder. So in the case of the Vietnam War, um, and especially after the experience of 19, 1950 to 1954, the Korean War, uh, were used to massed stand-up battles. So they were used to, you know, big set-piece battles where, you know, one force arrives, another force arrives. They fight sometimes for two or three days, and then somebody leaves the field broken, and the other, the other group holds the territory. Um, but this is not the way the NVA, the North Vietnamese Army, fights, and it's certainly not the way the guerrilla fight, the South Vietnamese guerrilla fights, right? The, that is, the, the Viet Cong fights. Um, and uh, it just drove them nuts. It drove the Marines nuts. So here points this out on 90, page 96. He says, it was enough to make an American commander sink to his knees and plead, oh, God, just once. Let it be our way. We have the strength. Give us the terms. <laughs> Not even the Cavs, so this is the Air Cavalry, uh, the first of the ninth, um, which is the uh, uh, the division, which is air, the first division, which is fully air mobile. I mean, that's it's it, it is only delivers people and takes them off the battlefield by helicopter. That's the only way. It's this, that's their their cavalry, uh, so that the um, the cavalry, which initially they're is still a cavalry actually in World War I, um, and there are still horses on the battlefield, unfortunately, for the horses in World War I. Um, uh, but then by World War II, the cavalry has become the armored cavalry, sometimes just usually just called a cav. Um, so that typically, if you were trained to be cavalry, you probably went into tanks and armor. Um, and then in Vietnam, uh, you may very well have trained to fight in helicopters. And obviously these technologies require new ways of thinking about strategy and tactics. Uh, you know, so the overall strategy is, you know, how, the strategy for the war, strategy for a battle. And then once you decided what your strategy is for a battle, it's like we want to, you know, we want to have this outcome. It's like, well, then the tactics are, like, how specifically are you going to get that done? Right, so strategy is your overall thing. It's like, well, okay, our strategy is this. And then the tactics are, you know, we're gonna use a series of, okay, so you decide. So, so here's this, here's Harry, here, you know, sort of channeling the uh, frustration of the American commander who wants a pitched battle. And when they do get pitched battles, this is the thing. They find that the Vietnamese are extremely tough and very hard to beat and, uh, Probably the most famous example of this, apart from oh, any of the things that happened in Tet, Way, the fighting in Way, or in uh, at Quezon is a good example. Um, but probably the most famous example is the Yadrang Valley. Um, and the Yadrang Valley battle, which goes on for days, uh, and it's an out and out 
I mean, it's just, they're, they, they knew where the enemy was and there's just this blistering fight that goes on and on and on between the two sides um, is discussed in a book by Joe Galloway called We Were Soldiers Once and Young, and it becomes a Mel Gibson vehicle in a film called We Were Soldiers, which takes up the first half of the book where you see um, the Americans are successful. <laughs> the second half of the book where they get cut to ribbons, they didn't make a film of it, which is uh, sort of this perfectly, you know, this is in the late 90s or the early 2000s, is like a perfect uh, sort of picture of, of how America saw Vietnam. It was like, well, we took this piece, you know. <laughs> anyway, uh, so we have the strength gives the terms, not even the calf. Uh, with their style and courage and mobility, because these are, the, so the cab, in this case, the air cavalry, were able to penetrate the abiding highland face. So this is the central highlands. Uh, there's, a, there's a ridge of mountains that runs up the uh, center of Vietnam, and they're just known as the central highlands. And uh, it was a terrible place to be caught. They were all terrible places to be caught. Hare's best, uh, Hare, Hare gives the best advice. It was great if you could adapt. You had to try but it wasn't the same thing as making a discipline, going into your own reserves and developing a real war metabolism. This is on pages 13 to 14. So here's, here's this little tiny, you know, crunchy bit of stuff at the beginning of the book where he delivers an incredible amount of oh, really, you know, the, 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 sort of summaries of, you know, how, to, how the war was and what it was like to be in Vietnam. Um, and so it may, that's why I've had us look at this part last because in some ways it's the toughest to read, it's the slowest to read, but it also makes the most sense after you've got some background. Um, so there's this, you know, if you can adapt, so you're saying if you can adapt to combat, uh, okay, you know, you gotta try. But his, the ideal is this very Zen thing, really. And, and here actually becomes a Buddhist, um, which is not really a surprise. Um, going into your own reserves and developing a real warm metabolism. So a real warm metabolism it would be a metabolism that just sees the fluctuations of warfare and sees the chaos <clears throat> and observes it, you know, and just rides it out. Um, it's like a surfer. Well, the people who successfully did that were the North Vietnamese, who really did adapt incredibly well to the jungle. And they took terrible losses, picked their battles, and swam in the sea. And, and here I'm paraphrasing Mao on gorillas. And this is a very famous, uh, Mao's Little Red Book at this point had become very famous because uh, China was becoming a world power. And uh, people were like, you got to read Mao's Little Red Book, and, which was basically a sort of reader on um, how to be a perfect communist or, you know, it's sort of what we're, it's kind of like a book of wisdom from the revolution. And uh, so Mao said in, in his little red book, and so here's this, this is a translation from the Chinese, the gorilla must move amongst the people as a fish swims in the sea. Um, and this was enormously quoted in, at the time because um, the, fluid it's it's really an interesting metaphor because it's about fluidity right and you you basically when you catch a fish it's like how do you know you've got do you have a civilian fish or is it a gorilla fish <laughs> you don't know it's not as though they're going to be marked so you, if you catch all the fish in the sea then there's nothing to eat so how are you going to do that so the idea of the gorilla the strength of the gorilla lies in this okay so i'm going to show you now uh, because i've been laying down some fairly heavy you know stuff uh so here's sort of one of the most famous um pieces of of helicopter assault probably ever filmed probably ever will be filmed um from apocalypse now and so this is the famous assault on this village uh complete with and i should say i'll come back and talk about it after but um a great deal of it is Unfortunately, accurate. The um, the cavalry goes on using the yellow scarf, which is very typically uh, an identifier of the cavalry. Uh, yellow uh, bands, flag scarves, um, which goes back a long way. That's why the horse head patch is yellow as a yellow ground. Um, you'll see the guy blowing the bugle. Also, uh, not uncommon. Um, 
yeah, I mean, most helicopter squadrons flew off bases. Um, <clears throat> so this is, an this is the first CAV. And so the first CAV is an attack uh, squadron. That's its job. Its job is not to pick people up and drop them off. Its job is to take the attack to the enemy and then fly away, basically. So that's the concept, is, right? We'll use technology to be our guerrilla. Okay. Um, and then you're going to have the uh, psyops, the psychological operations, where they're going to have the big speakers and they're going to play the Ride of the Valkyries, which is uh, this famous piece of Wagner, 19th century opera by Wagner. And uh, it's just, um, it's the story of Siegfried, part of the story of Siegfried in the Ring Cycle, uh, who uh, it will bring about the end of the old world and the beginning of the new world and so on. The irony here is that uh, Wagner was adopted by the Nazis. Um, so this is a particularly uh, sort of ironic musical choice um, <laughs> to use. And, um, and then we have this crazy colonel um, who is all too recognizable in the number of, of veterans I've, I've met who have said, uh, oh yeah, you know, that Colonel Kilgore yeah, we know him. Um, so these are some things to watch for as you <laughs> see this piece of incredible film by Francis Ford Coppola.